that next action that he has for you. Is this making sense? Amen. Uh, oh, I just hit your button there. No, you no, no. that's okay. Yeah. We'll get back on <laughs> uh, A prerequisite is something that is required of you so that the Lord can call you up yeah. and we could say commission you, yeah. send you forth on a specific task or give you another responsibility. But you must have some things in order. If we are enlisted men and women of God, then it is incumbent upon us that we have certain characteristics, that we are a certain way. Yeah. Last week, again, we introduced this topic of being enlisted. We, we spoke of the Levites. You remember the Levites of 1 Chronicles chapter 23? Yeah. How these were men who, it was, it was in their... It was in their blood almost. Yep, yep. That they knew that when the Levites knew when they reached 30 years of age that they were going to be called up and called into service in the temple or the tabernacle to, to perform offerings and sacrifices or to assemble and prepare and to maintain the condition of the temple and, ta and the tabernacle. And in 1 Chronicles 23, we saw that David understood that the weight of glory, that the glory coming to Jerusalem, since the Lord was now dwelling forever in Jerusalem, you remember this, right? Yeah. That this glory that was coming was going to require some more enlistment. Yeah. That not only was it for the 30-year-olds and up of the Levites, but now we need the 20-year-olds and up. Yeah. And he could call upon them because these men were ready. Yeah. They understood that it was important to be ready. To, so that they could bear up under the weight of glory that the Lord is preparing for his people. Yeah. Yeah. Read this for you here. That perhaps this week, now we can state it more clearly, that it was for an unprecedented invasion of God's glory that 20-year-old Levites were called and found ready. Everyone say, found ready. Ready. We're talking about prerequisites. They had some things in place so that when they were called, they were capable to do what they were being asked Amen. to do. Amen. They were called and found ready for action in temple service. A great demand, sorry, a great need demands our service. Everyone raise your hand and say, My service. My service. A great need demands our service. Yeah. The coming, the coming glory of God to be revealed in the harvest calls for great, for ready laborers. Luke chapter 10 verse 2 says, Jesus was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Oh, yeah. Therefore, beseech or urge or beg the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into this harvest. We saw that last week, that there is a coming glory. Yeah. But I want to read a few verses to you quickly. I got two verses for you. I want you just to write them down and listen carefully. We can see there is a coming glory. Isaiah 40 verse 5 says that the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all people will see it together. Amen. For the mouth of the Lord is spoken. Amen. The glory of the Lord will be revealed and all will see it together. Romans 8.18 sounds a lot like. 2 Corinthians 4 from last week, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Yeah. These two verses state clearly that the coming revelation of Jesus Christ on this earth is glory. This is a most substantial weight and it is, and it is eternal. Everyone say, every eye. Every, every eye. Every eye will see this glory that is coming. While all things past and present have been only partially revealed and mostly hidden, every eye, every eye will behold the glory every of Jesus. Eye. The Spirit of God is going to help us today. What are some, he's going to help us to see today what are some qualities that serve as prerequisites for the enlisted. You are enlisted to bear the responsibility that your faithfulness will bring about the glory of God being Amen. revealed. Amen. You have been enlisted so that your willingness to take the responsibility 
being required of you to carry, that it is going to bring in, usher in the very presence of God on this earth. The glory of God will be made manifest because you choose to walk in obedience. Yeah. You have been enlisted for this. So the Spirit of God is going to help us see today what are some of the qualities that serve as prerequisites for the enlisted. Yeah. What must be or what must be being woven into your character in order for you to be positioned, ready for the call of God to his service? Come on, everybody say enlisted. enlisted. You can go ahead and turn to 2 Timothy 2. We're going to take off there, just as Pastor Jake took off there last week with a message entitled Enlisted, the glorious weight of responsibility. So when you get to 2 Timothy, say there. There. Get there with me, there. saints. And as you're getting there, Come on. I can't help but get excited again as we're in this tent, right? For however many more Sundays we have. It's a few, at least. But just, just take a look around. Just take it in. Yeah. The lights are dim because the nice. sun's gone behind the clouds. Nice. We're tucked in here together. We got some heat. Come on, move we got some smiling faces. Yeah, the yeah. brothers and sisters are around you. Look at them. Yeah. Look at your family, church. We're rich. Come on, company man. Look at your brothers. Look at them and say enlisted. enlisted. Tell them they're enlisted. they're enlisted. Remind them of their enlistment in this army. You know, this is exciting. To me, yeah. it's very exciting to think yes. of the war that's ahead of us. Now, everybody else might not be quite like that in their mind. But if I think, as Elder Chris told us on Thursday, he was talking about what it means to be enlisted in the military and what he had to vow and pledge to the earth, to, to the earth, to the United States of America yeah. and what he would do and what he would surrender and what he would sacrifice for yeah. the United States, yeah. which is beautiful. Yeah. Praise God for men in here that have served our country and are serving. We need that. But how much greater for you to look around mm. at your brothers and sisters yeah. and think of this. You therefore, my son, be strong that is in the grace that is Christ Jesus. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust these to faithful men yeah. who will be able to teach others also. No. Come on, soldiers. Come on, enlisted men and women of God. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And remember, my good enlisted brothers and sisters, that no soldier who has been enlisted, a prerequisite, okay? A prerequisite for you, which is a great word to keep saying. The more you say it, the better you get at saying it. The more you write it, the better you get at spelling it. I've learned that this week. Prerequisite, prerequisite, prerequisite. Prerequisite. These are our prerequisites. The things that what you're hearing Pastor Jake declare in worship, that is a prerequisite. The truth that Pastor Zeke declared, why are we trusting in an arm of flesh to lead us into battle? Do you want to fail? Zach, sorry, I'm not yelling at you. Zach, do you want to fail miserably and return to your own vomit like a dog is what the word tells us? Then take this enlistment seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Take it very seriously. Amen. Every time you wake up, as the elder encouraged us a long time ago, to pray and seek his face. Every meeting that you could possibly get to, be at with your family. Not because we're checking boxes saying, oh, they were there. They get a gold star. The world may do that. We're saying this is for your good. Yeah. This is for my good. You're enlisted. These are your prerequisites. No soldier in active service will entangle in things in the affairs of everyday life. That's the glorious weight of responsibility that your pastor gave to us last week. I was listening to it as I rose this morning. So that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. You're seeking to follow these prerequisites, these commands, these ordinances, because it will attach you, as Brother Parker told us, to the very thing that gives you sustenance. The very thing, the only thing that can give you life, attach yourself to it by listening to these prerequisites, by understanding that you have been enlisted. And then don't forget how important it is that you zakar, but even greater that you would walk or that you would halak. Or I'll even go as far to say that you would zakar. Amen. Or yeah. zamar, what you have zakar. That you would praise and you would keep striking Amen. and keep striking and keep striking the enemy and your life. So we can see what kind of produce it's going to have. Yeah. If we don't want the prerequisites of this world, Michael and I were talking about this. What would be the prerequisites for you to come actually stand up here and preach in the world's eyes? Yeah. You know them. Yep. You know them. 
<laughs> and yet, and yet, I'll put Pastor Jack against any theologian, any Pharisee. I wouldn't have a question. You know why? And you know why you can say that too? It's because you know your pastor. Yeah. Yeah. And it's because we desire to smell like him. <laughs> we desire to be so close to him. So close. You know where I'm referencing this from. So close to your sheep that you smell like him. Old Spice Pierce Porter. Your shepherd, your shepherd would be so near you. How sad is it, church? How sad is it that you would have to schedule a meeting with Jake months and months in advance and he may not even want to see you so he would send someone else? How sad is that? Come on. A prerequisite of Jake's life is that he's there for you. Yeah. And he does well with it. Yes. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. It's very exciting. Yeah, it and we're going to get more excited about it as we move forward. We don't want what the world has. We don't want what they say qualifies a man or qualifies a woman. We've seen it done with worship and it's awful. It is awful and terrible. Awkward. And very awkward. You have 35 people on stage and no one can lead you into the presence of God. Yeah. That's not good. That's not exciting. Yeah. When we have four or five people up here right here that can lead you into the presence of God. And not because of their talent. Come on. Their talents, and I always say that. Yeah. But because they're anointed to do it. Yeah. Because they're seeking to have clean hands and pure hearts. And they're very vulnerable and exposed before each other. And that unifies them very tightly. We want the biblical patterns of this word to be what are our prerequisites. The world's not our home. It's a far different place. Amen. It's a far different place than we want to go. Yeah. Going to the home of our Father. And He's teaching us to make that right here, right now. We don't need the knowledge of this world. We need the divine intervention of the Holy Spirit to continuously enlist us into this army. Two verses that I'm going to share, and then Pastor Jake's going to take us to the book of Numbers. This first passage is a beautiful one. Psalms. One, one, one. That's Psalms 111, verse number 10. A beautiful prerequisite for you to hold to and for your family to hold to. And if you got kids in here, then let them hold to this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of your wisdom. Yeah. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. The word tells us the fear of the Lord is the start. Yep. Not the fear of man, not the understanding of curriculum, though we like curriculum, but not the understanding of the pattern of this world, but the understanding to do what he has enlisted you to do. Yep. And the other one is this, as you do that, Proverbs 22 becomes true of you. A good name is then established through walking in these prerequisites. And a good name is more desirable than all the riches of this world. Amen. You hold to these things consistently over time. And you get something. Yeah. You get a name. Yeah. And not, not a title. Not a title. Not senior pastor. Yeah. But you get a name that the Lord says is good because you've been desiring him. Yep. And the riches of this world, whatever they are to you, we all have our own riches. But this is worth way more. Mm. These two verses are some verses that uh, have come to mind. Pastor Jake's going to take us to Numbers. So you go ahead and turn to Numbers as we begin to lay out some more groundwork. For this message entitled, Enlisted, the Prerequisites. Come on. Come on. Everyone say prerequisites. prerequisites. Now, in, in the book of Numbers, chapters 3 and 4, you'll see, you can just listen to this little bit here. Proverbs, or Numbers chapter 3 is when the Lord tells, he tells Moses and Aaron, he says, that the Levites, the tribe of Levi, yep. has been set apart for him. Yep. And God says, I own the firstborn of every family in Israel, but I have chosen instead of taking instead of taking everyone's firstborn, I am going to take the entire tribe of Levi yeah. to represent the firstborn of all of Israel. Yeah. So Levi is a tribe that belongs completely completely to the Lord. In Numbers chapter three, they count the Levites. There are twenty-two thousand young men, or twenty-two thousand men. Yeah. From one month old all the way up, that are available to the Lord for service throughout their lifetime. They belong to Him. And then He says in Numbers chapter 4, He says, I want you to count from this family all of the all of the sons, the 30 years and older. Count from this family 
All of the all of the men 30 years and older. We talked about this last week, right? Yeah. All right, so in Numbers chapter 3 and chapter 4, you have God choosing and counting the Levites. And this is right around the year 1300, okay? So we're, we're about 300 years, 3 to 400 years pre-David. King David will be king about 3 to 400 years from this moment, okay? From the time they leave Egypt, about 400 years later, we have King David. So for 3 to 400 years, it has been established that from 30 years, particularly 30 to 50, though they were allowed to serve longer than that if they wanted, the Levites were available all of the time. Their life was to serve in the tabernacle. Amen. And so what we saw last week was a shift in that number from 30 and up to 20 and up, right? Now I want to read this to you. Years of diligence. When the time came, the Levites were ready. Years of diligence. Everyone say, years of diligence. Years of diligence. Because a time was going to come when the Lord was going to call upon the Levites. So years of diligence was required so that way, so that when the call came, they were ready. They had positioned themselves to be useful even in their 20s, as we saw last week. All of them were ready for temple service. But it clearly had said, by tradition, if you look in Numbers chapter 4, this is regarding the sons, the family of Kohath, but it's also regarding the rest of the sons of Levi too, but I'm going to read this to you. Everyone say Kohath. Kohath. He's one of the sons of Levi, okay? It says, verse 3, from 30 years and upward, even to 50 years old, all who enter the service to do the, the work in the tent of meeting. He's talking about who to count. Okay, but you could go through that chapter and find where it talks about the sons of Kohath, 30, and 30 to 50, the sons of Gershon, 30 to 50, and the sons of Merari, 30 to 50. All of the Levites, 30 to 50, were to be ready for service. Have we made that clear? Yeah. Okay, they do this for three to four hundred years, they keep this tradition. But as we said last week, when David is king, he's at the end of his life and he says, I need the 20-year-olds now, too. And they were ready. Yeah. I'm going to drive this point home. Let us remember why it was that the Levites had been chosen to represent the firstborn. Listen closely. We're talking about prerequisites, things that you want to have woven into your character, that you want the Lord to develop into you, things that you want to grow and mature in so that when the Lord has a need whether you choose to or not, you're there ready. And if yeah. he calls upon you, you're ready. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. good. So let us remember why it is that the Levites were ready. Why was it that they had been chosen? They were chosen to represent the firstborn of all Israel before Adonai. At a time when wickedness had swept and held sway over the entire camp of the Israelites, yep. just 40 days after the Red Sea, it was... Only the sons of Levi who had kept themselves separate from the golden calf idolatry. Wow. Wow. God said, these men will be holy mine and I will make myself holy theirs. God, said it. Yeah. God became their inheritance over and above all earthly things. Yes. Is this not the handling of all things light and momentary for the sake of having that glorious and eternal weight of God's pleasure yeah. and approval? Yeah. Levi gained the pleasure and approval of God. Because they regarded the presence of God and the holiness of God as something of greater importance than to feel the comfort of being accepted by the rest of their kinsmen or to fall into the same attractions that their kinsmen were falling to. They, were, they withheld so that they could be holy to the Lord. Yep. Good. This is the heritage of the sons of Levi, God's pleasure and his approval. When idolatrous compromise and passivity is the prevailing mode of the day. Even among those who call themselves by his name. God's men. Everyone say God's men. God's men. Say God's company. God's company. They do not cease to walk in the prescribed ancient path. It makes them look radical or extreme. But it's really only because they remain unchanging in the midst of a constantly changing crowd. It is to look at a field 
and compare the stately unwavering oak with the swaying grasses. The men of Levi were upright. Yeah. We're going to see this in a little bit. Yeah. The men of Levi understood what the heart of God was and they held fast to it. Come on, because they were diligent to preserve, pre sorry, to preserve the ways of God in their lives. And they were diligent to do so for 300 to 400 years. Then those who were not yet even required for service were ready for service. Amen. Because it was in them yeah. to be fully dedicated to the Lord and to see to it that they were always refreshing themselves oh, and being dedicated to the Lord. Yeah. They, were, they were always, they were never asleep at the wheel. Yeah. They didn't say, I've got 10 years left to be ready. They didn't say, well, I'm, I'm a Levite. I'm just the son of Merari. I don't get to do all the fancy sacrifices that the sons of Kohath get to do. I'm going to relax, and plus I'm only 19 years old. No, these men remained ready. They were diligent and upright in heart. They remained ready. We're going to look today. We're seeing a little bit of the Levites. We're going to see them a little bit more today. But we're going to give you some examples of men who were ready, who were found ready, so that way... Though they didn't know that God was going to call, when God called, they were ready. Amen. They were candidates. Yeah. They had the prerequisites. Yeah. And so what we're going to see particularly today, that there is a diligence and there's an uprightness of heart. And we're going to see some very specific things as well, particularly in the life of Gideon. Yeah. We're, going to we're going to see men who have the prerequisites yeah. so that way when called... They can be ready to take that position. Amen. Everyone say prerequisites. Prerequisites. Everybody say upright heart. Upright heart. Everybody say diligent. Diligent. But that's a prerequisite for you that Pastor Jake was just giving you. And like Pastor Jake said, we're going to break from that just for a moment to give you a practical example. One that you know very well, Amen. but one that we're yeah. going to glean some new things from. So go ahead and turn to the book of Judges. Yeah. And then go to the sixth chapter of that book of Judges. And hang out right there. Yeah. We're going to start talking about a mighty man of valor named Gideon. Come on. Yes. Named Gideon, who had characteristics of a mighty man of valor David. because of the prerequisites that he held to. Being very similar to what Pastor Jake just took us through. An unwavering man. A man of great confidence and ability to obey. Yeah. Regardless of circumstances that were yeah. unfolding all around him. Yep. Yeah. What is a requirement? What is expected of you as a man or a woman? We're going to look at Gideon, yeah. and we're going to look at what he had in the very core of his being yeah. that made him who he was and made him a man that God was going to call upon. Yeah. So if you go to the book of Judges, which you are, you'll see in chapter 6 that Israel is being oppressed by who? It's not, the, Midianites. It's not the grasshoppers, right, Oscar? It's the Midianites. It's a bug life reference. It's a great movie that really speaks towards this story if you want to watch it. Right. <laughs> but the Midianites are being, they're oppressing God's people. And they're stealing from them, taking all their food that they worked so hard to acquire. And they're having to pay them off so that they don't come and kill them and eat them. Yeah. That's, that's the movie. That's not in the scripture. a good character that wants to fly. But the power of Midian over Israel was something to behold. At least that's what most of the Israelites thought. But the power prevailed against Israel because of Midian. The sons of Israel made for themselves dens, which were in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. So if you go to verse 11, the angel of the Lord comes to a man. And it says his name is Gideon. And he was, yes, his name means hewer, just so you know. Gideon was beating out wheat in the wine press. In order to save it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Yes. And before yeah. we give you a list, which is very practical, of, of some pre -west prerequisites that we see in the life of Gideon, I want to explain to you a little bit about this. Is that okay? Yeah. Well, because he is doing something here, right? He is beating out wheat in a wine press. Does, it, does that make sense to anybody yeah. why that's kind of weird? You don't beat out your grains and your wheat in a wine press. A wine press is for pressing your grapes or your olives or whatever so you can get oil. 
The beating out of wheat would have taken place out in the open, yes. where the wind would have its way with the chaff. Yes. So, I'll read this for you. A wine press is a pit or a vat where grapes are collected and then juice is pressed. So you may say this is below ground a little bit. Yeah. I mean, perhaps you wouldn't be seen in the wine press. Right. And they would put this wine after pressing it into a large container, okay? But Gideon was not pressing grapes in a wine press, which was a normal thing that would have been happening. He was rather threshing his wheat as a hewer of wheat and a hewer of men to be in a wine press not a threshing floor. This is just something for us to note, and it'll make sense more in a second. A wine press is also symbolically used in the Bible to express the wrath and the judgment. You've heard that before, right? The wrath and the judgment of the Lord coming. Uh, and Isaiah and Joel and Lamentations have some references to that. A threshing floor, you're with me? Yeah. yeah. Is a flat place. You've seen, we did a teaching on this some time ago, but it's a flat place where a threshing sledge would go over the grain. It was usually located at the edge of a village, frequently on a flat rock or an outcropping, very visible to the eye. So is it making sense to you why Gideon was in the wine press doing this? He just didn't want to be seen because he didn't want him to come and take his food, take his family's livelihood. Right. So the threshing, which was the removal of the kernel of grain from its stalk, was done by different methods. He was beating his grain like a farmer. He was a hewer, so he was probably chewing this wheat and getting the grain from this. Now, why was Gideon doing this? The time Gideon was threshing his wheat was not the best of time. You know this because you know the word, right? He's being oppressed. Yeah. The whole place is covered with Midianites looking to steal and to kill and to take. The place he was threshing wasn't the right place, but he discovered he had to do something. Amen. Oh, mighty man of valor Amen. that he was. He had to do something. And though the circumstances for this in Gideon's time were not perfect, sound familiar? Right. He knew he must use what he had to achieve something. Amen. Yep. He mustn't resign to fate or fold his arms if he and his family would not die of hunger. Yeah, right. Right? He's Amen. a man of valor. Yep. The angel of the Lord knew this. Like Pastor Jake kind of said, we read this and we think, man, what a coward. He's just hiding. He's just hiding in the wine press. No, quite the contrary. This man was a warrior. He was a valiant warrior. So he therefore turned the wine press into a threshing floor. That's a good word. That's a good word for us. To turn your wine press into a place of threshing. He couldn't go to the normal threshing floor, which would have exposed him to the attack of the enemy. But it wasn't faithful. It wasn't, he wasn't faithless. He had a fear of God that drove him to the wine press to perform this work. This was just a simple product of a situation that he had come upon and his whole countrymen had come upon. Yet unknown to Gideon, and catch this, I thought this was beautiful. God was seeking to appoint him as a man to make distinctions among the people. Amen. Yep. Which a threshing floor would, would do. He would distinguish what is... What is good kernel and what is chaff to be blown away. That was what the threshing floor was doing for him. And he's doing it and he's standing in a wine press which would have been speaking to him to stand as an executor of the divine judgment that is the man who treads in the wine press. Amen. Gideon was doing both at the same time. Yep. Or at least it was representative of both at the same Amen. time. He was threshing wheat and distinguishing and he was doing it in a place of judgment Amen. where he would then act as God's judge and judge the people. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. Now as we continue gleaning, gleaning some from Gideon here, in these next passages we're going to see some prerequisites. So I want you to pay attention because a lot of us who know about Gideon, we understand him as being, you know, the Lord comes and speaks life to Gideon, right? We've heard yeah. the message before. But like he's, he's afraid and God speaks what's apparently not true about him. Mighty man of valor. Yeah. And it's not to debate that teaching or what's been stated. I'm sure there was some fear. But of course, as you know, if you never know what fear is, then you know what it is to act in faith. Yeah. And yeah. so there's some fear there. But I want you to understand that Gideon is, he's acting, he's acting with valor. He yeah. is acting with valor. Yeah. Yeah. There's a man whose position that the Lord is finding that in his pastor's acts going to show us that Gideon, when the angel of the Lord shows up, 
if he was a man who was just a scaredy cat, he would have doubled over in fear when the angel of the Lord showed up. Yeah. But instead he has a conversation with him. Like, explain to me why this is happening. Gideon, and he, he faces the presence of the angel of the Lord in this way. Wow. Samson's parents were like, we're going to die. Yeah. The angel of the Lord's here. Gideon says, if the Lord's with us, then why is this happening? Yeah. We're going to see, Pastor Zach's going to keep walking us through the life of Gideon, but I want you to understand the Gideon is not the terrified weakling that he's been often painted to be. Yeah. Yeah. He's actually a man who is waiting and he's relatively expected, a little bit frustrated, and he's valiant because he's doing what he has to do yeah. in the hour of trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, now that you know where Gideon's at, why he's there and what he's doing, let's keep reading. So now it says, the angel of the Lord appears to him and looks at him and says, hey, man, a valiant warrior. And Gideon turns and says to the Lord, this is what Pastor just telling us, he says, oh my Lord, oh my Lord, if, if you are with us, why then has all this happened to us? That's a, that's a bold man. That's a confident man to say something like that to an angel of the Lord. And he says, where are all these miracles which our father told us about? Saying, did the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hands of Midian. This is a conversation with an wow. angel of the Lord. And the Lord looked at him and said, go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? And he said to him, O Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in Manasseh, and I'm the youngest in my father's house. But the Lord says to him, Surely I will be with you, and you will defeat Midian as one man. Amen. So Gideon said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign. Who is Gideon to ask for a sign of the Lord? Who is this man, O valiant warrior, to say, All right, give me a sign. He said, he's a valiant warrior. He says, please do not depart from me until, um, from here until I come back to thee. And, and Gideon's looking to bring an offering and lay it out before the Lord. And the angel of the Lord says, I'll remain until you return. Now look, Gideon had some prerequisites that we want to give you this morning. And we want you to hold to these just as a list. Now, obviously, there's a... There is a huge list of prerequisites for our faith and what we have to do. Some are very practical. It's snowing. Wow. Some are very practical. Some are very, very simple, can seem elementary to you. But really think on this list that we're gonna that we're Come gonna on. read, we're gonna give Come to on. you. Yeah. And really think of these prerequisites and where you are with these prerequisites. Okay? Yeah. And how we can grow in them. How we can achieve and grow in these things. So Gideon had the prerequisite of humility. Of humility. Yep. He's threshing wheat in a wine press. <laughs> That's a humble thing to do because you know that you look foolish and you may look cowardly. But he's using this wine press as a threshing floor. It's that he's accepted the current conditions. This is absolutely humiliating. <laughs> the situation that they're in. They can't even thresh their own. They labor as Pastor Zach said earlier, they labor for harvest, labor for harvest, labor for harvest. The Midianites, Midianites come in and take their harvest. You're basically a slave. Yeah. Gideon has accepted the situation as, I have to do what I need to do. Come on. You, you see the character there. Yeah. Yeah. You understand what's at stake. You understand what's on the line. And you would do what you have to do yeah. to be able to survive or to persevere. Yeah. Not talking about sin. We all know this. He's, he's been humbled. He, he's, he's being this, as valiant as a man he can no matter, in the situation that he finds himself. Yeah, yeah. So Gideon has this character trait, this characteristic of he's been humiliated, he's accepted the situation and the condition, and he's doing everything he can to be able to persevere and to move forward. And, yeah, and as Pastor Zach's going to walk us through the rest of these, consider the mindset that he has to have. For him to ask the questions yeah. he asks and yeah. say the things that he says. Go yeah. ahead. That's a good reminder because you think really this prerequisite of humility, how many times have you been doing something that you thought you shouldn't be doing this? I should be further than this or yeah. I should be in a better spot than this. Why am I here? Wow. 
Right. And we say, as long as we're not in sin, wickedness has led us there. And even there, the Lord's gracious and can move us from place to place. Amen. Yeah. But we have to be able to say, Lord, what are you humbling me in that you would have me right here in this wine press, threshing this wheat to feed my family? I trust you, Lord. You're going to do something magnificent with this. What is it? Yeah. Show me. The next prerequisite is this godly concern. This godly concern for the people of Israel, the apple of God's eye. This idea of the godly concern for your brothers and sisters around you. The godly concern for us to have for the lost and the dying people all around us. Even when wickedness is happening all around us, we see Gideon, a compassionate man, filled with godly concern. That's why he says, Lord, why is this happening to your people? He's concerned about what God's concerned about. Right. And that's a prerequisite that we need to take hold of a little better. Gideon has a prerequisite to Zakar. He remembers the things that God has done. And he remembers the things that God has said he's going to do. Yeah. And he's saying, Lord, come on, what are we? What is this happening for? You're the God of all Israel. You have the power to do this. He's yeah. a cars and he knows yep. that his God has done great things. And I think and believe that Gideon knew that God was going to do it again. Amen. Yep. Scared, trembling maybe, maybe a bit fearful. But he knows that God's going to do it again. This must be a constant for us. Yeah. As has been stated several times in the past year of sermons from us. Zakar, yep. remember these things and hold fast to them. Gideon also has a prerequisite of spiritual hunger. A spiritual hunger. This goes along with the godly concern, but this spiritual hunger is wanting to see those miracles again. Amen. He says, what has happened? My father told me of these miracles that were happening. I want to see the spiritual well-being of your people come back to life. Amen. Come on, that's needed right yep. now. Yep. That's needed right now for us. The bride of Christ needs that daily, and we need it right now. Yeah. That our spiritual hunger would be such like Gideon. Mm -hmm. That it would grow in desire. Even when we're pressing, even when we're uh, threshing our wheat in the wine press, we're saying, Lord, Spirit, fill us and yeah. give us strength that we might do and perform and see these great works again. Yeah. Gideon had a prerequisite of being teachable. Uh-oh. Being moldable, being teachable, willing to learn because he listened when the angel of the Lord told him. You are going to do this. You are going to be instructed on how to do this. And we know the story of Gideon, right? That many other instructions are given to him, and it's very confusing as to why it would be done that way. Yeah. Right? Narrowing them down. Narrowing them down to the 300, right? Yep. Why would this happen? Well, because he's teachable, Amen. and because he's moldable, and because he's a good disciple. Amen. And he knows that a prerequisite must be to follow the way that the Lord has told me to go. Amen. The last prerequisite that we'll give right now is that Gideon has this prerequisite to recognize that he on his own is weak. It's why when he calls him a valiant warrior, he says, I'm the least. I'm the least of my family. It's, it's not going to be done on my strength. How are we doing with that? How are we doing with that when the Lord calls us? Like was spoken over us, this flesh, this arm of flesh. Is that what we desire to use to get us through? To say, yes, Lord, I can do that. And then in a week, two weeks, two months, you're like, I can't. I, I, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this, or I'm not going to show up to this, or I'm not going to give this, or I'm not going to make this call. I'm not going to, what is it? I'm not going to pray this way. I'm not going to fast. I'm not going to do this. It's because that arm of flesh is weak. And yeah. Gideon knew. Yeah. He recognized. I can't. I can't do it. But when the angel of the Lord says to him, you will do this. Yeah. He realizes, I can do this. Amen. Yeah. Come on. And I want to read this quote to you. It says, unlikely men become likely men yes. because of past diligence. Amen. Let me read it to you again. Unlikely men become likely men wow. because of past diligence. What genius said that? That's Pastor Jake, a scholar and a theologian of your very day. Amen. Unlikely men, saints. Wow. Unlikely men. Yeah. Men that the world would say, nah, it's not going to happen through them. But guess what? A consistency over time. A consistency over yeah. time. A spiritual hunger over time. A humility over time. Yeah. An ability to learn and be taught over time. A hunger, a deep hunger for the spiritual things of our King 
over time. The ability to remember in Zakar what the Lord has done over time. Yep. Talking not days or hours. We've talked about this before. You had a prophecy come to you a week later. It hasn't come true. That prophecy is on the back burner. What else do you have, Lord? Because I need it now. That's wicked. Yeah. yeah. Gideon would hold to the word of God. And because of that, an unlikely man would become a likely man because yep. he remained diligent Amen. what the Lord told him. Amen. We were talking about this um, Thursday morning with uh, Elder Chris. We were, at, we were at Wegmans with Elder Chris. Wow. Yeah. Boy, that was sweet. That was glorious. Um, and uh, we were thinking about this story. We think about Gideon threshing wheat. I wanna, we want to make this very, very real for you, okay? He's in a wine press threshing wheat. I don't know who's with him. I don't know how many. He could be alone. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. He's doing... Just he, He's laboring. He's working. There's nothing spiritual about what he's doing, as far as he's concerned. Yeah. Family needs to eat. I need to thresh wheat where no one's going to see it and steal it. Yeah. And when the angel comes, the messenger of the Lord, carrying God's word to Gideon, his response to that messenger is, all these things that Pastor Zach just shared with us, how he says, if God is with us, then... Why are we in the condition that we're in? Why is God's presence not carrying us out? What has he been zakaring? You can look at this negatively, like he's being a cynic or complaining, but he's actually, he's willing to wrestle with this. And then, and then he reveals that he's been waiting for something to happen again. You see the condition of heart that, a, that a bad, even a bad situation finds Gideon in. He could be a little bit bitter. He could be a little sour. He could, I mean, he's still covered in his flesh. He's yeah. not a perfect man. Yeah. We'll know later on he's definitely not a perfect man. But he's a man who's concerned with the affairs of God's people and God's interactions with his people. And he's musing on it. And just imagine the way I am like when I'm, if I'm splitting wood. Or, you know, when you're doing something, you're, Elder Chris, is built, he's built some fine furniture. When he's in that workshop, what's running through What's, what's running through his mind? What's he musing yeah. on? What are you musing on? Yeah. When you're doing your daily duties, when you're working, when you're taking care of your responsibility, physical responsibilities, what are you musing on? What is the presence of the Lord finding in you should he show up and begin to try to speak with you? Yeah. What interaction will he get from you? Will you not even hear his voice? Will you not even be willing to wrestle with the challenge of God's spirit when he comes to interact with you, though you're just about daily activity? What prerequisites do you have? What preconditions are there for you? So that way when God comes to visit you in that hour of mundane labor or a moment of difficulty, are you, what interaction is he getting from you? And where does he end up with you? Does he end up with a... A willing heart to go on and do what he's wrestling with you to accomplish? Or does he end up with you, again, stubborn like a mule, saying, we're not going there anymore, Lord. There's a prerequisite that the Lord requires. He has requires. It's been redundant. He has for you to possess. So that way when he visits you in an hour of calling upon your name, he finds a ready servant. What interaction is the Lord getting from you? Now I want to turn your attention to, first, to uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 29. We're going to do this quickly because we're, 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 um, we're going to make this good time. And we're going to speak the very, clear, the, wor the very clear word of the Lord to you today. Yeah. Particularly what's on my heart, what's on Pastor Zach's heart. We're talking about this diligence. Yeah. We say the word consistency all the time. And diligence is very much part of consistency. Yeah. It is consistency. Yep. And consistency is to be diligent. Second Chronicles chapter 29. I wrote first there, but it's second. It's my fault. What's happening here is, you remember King Hezekiah? Okay, we, I'm so glad that many of us have walked through the history of the kings yeah, so we can draw on some of this stuff and not have to reach so far back um, or have a little bit of understanding at least. Hezekiah is king and he's the first 
good king in a long time. His father, Ahaz, was wicked, and he filled the temple of the Lord, the whole courtyard, with altars to the hosts of heaven. They were sacrificing on a wicked altar next to God's brazen altar that Moses had uh, commanded to be constructed. And Ahaz had, had defiled God's temple. And in 2 Chronicles 29, Hezekiah stands up and he says, it's time to clean out the temple of the Lord. And so they take, uh, I forget how many days, 19, 20 days, to clean out the whole temple of the Lord. And at the end of this time, when they've cleaned it out in 2 Chronicles 29, he says, now it's time. Now that the temple is ready, it's been consecrated, the people can begin to bring their offerings to the Lord. The sacrifices and sin offerings have been, now let's bring the free will offerings. And the people begin to flood, flood the temple with sacrifices and offerings. And look at verse 32. The number of burnt offerings the assembly brought was 70 bulls, 100 rams, and 200 male lambs, all of them for burnt offerings to the Lord. The animals consecrated as sacrifices amounted to 600 bulls and 3,000 sheep and goats. The priests, however, were too few to skin all the burnt offerings. So their relatives, the Levites, helped them until the task was finished Amen. and until yeah. other priests had been consecrated. For the Levites had been more conscientious in consecrating themselves than the priests had been. There were burnt offerings in abundance, together with the fat and the fellowship offerings and the drink offerings that accompanied the burnt offerings. I want you to understand something. That in the days of wickedness, in the days of King Ahaz, the Levites and the priests of the Levites had been hiding themselves so as to avoid being killed, <laughs> avoid persecution. They'd been making themselves look a little bit more like just normal Israelites. Say what you will about them, they were scared. Yeah. But they weren't consecrated to the Lord. Mm. And so when, the, when King Hezekiah became king, they began to come out of the woodwork. Yeah. Of course, they had lived many years unconsecrated and unprepared to labor and to do work for the Lord. And so the priests were not ready. And so there weren't very many priests available. There weren't enough priests available to skin all of these offerings. We're talking thousands. I mean, it's a big task. And it says, you saw that in the scripture, didn't you see that? It says that the priests were too few. Yeah. Yep. So what do we see? Levites. The relatives, the Levites, helped them. These are men who aren't actually supposed to partake in preparing the offerings. By law, by the word of the Lord through Moses, just the sons of Aaron, the yep. Levites, sons of Aaron, sons of Kohath, sons of Aaron were to skin the animals to prepare the offerings and offer them. But because there were too, too few and God was worthy of his sacrifice, yeah. Yeah. the Levites were ready. Yeah, the right. Levites were ready. Yeah. Now at this point, 20 years and older, they were ready because they were more conscientious or they were more upright in heart. Yeah. These were men, conscientious means to do something thoroughly and rightly and to completion out of conviction. That's good. The Levites were diligent to make sure that they remained consecrated for the yeah. work of the Lord. This is a prerequisite to wow. be called into yeah. service. We looked at the Levites, we're looking at Gideon. You're seeing some particular things in the life of Gideon that you can zero in on and ask yourself, where are the, where are the concerns of my heart? What am I meditating on? How am I zakaring? What am I hoping for? Yeah. Yeah. What interaction is the Spirit of God getting from me in that hour of His visitation with me? Mm. Is He finding a mule that He has to drag about with bit and bridle? Or is He finding a faithful servant whose loyalty has been purchased by the blood of His Son and therefore He goes wherever I lead Him? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in this case, in 2 Chronicles, there is a great need... And some men have been slow and hesitant to consecrate themselves for whatever reason. Some out of fear. Some out of, we'll just leave it to whatever reason. They weren't ready. But the Levites, the sons of Levi, we find that they had this prerequisite. They were diligent to keep themselves upright in heart and ready. So when that time came, the hour of the Lord's 
need, if you will. The hour of the Lord's call, that they were gonna, he was going to get the response out of them that was needed. I am ready. I am ready. But they were ready because they maintained an uprightness in heart. They didn't hide and tuck themselves away when wickedness was on the rise, like some of the priests did. But the Levites remained consecrated. And when the hour of that need came, they could respond quickly with a yes to the Lord and see to it that his work was done. Are you tracking with us this morning? A prerequisite in particular is a diligence to keep your heart, like Deuteronomy 4 says, to watch your heart, keep your heart so that it doesn't go to the right or to the left, but stays in the ways of the Lord. Because when that moment comes, when the call of the Lord, when the officer who has enlisted you says, Where are my enlisted men at? Because I have a call. I have a need to be filled. And all of that, your availability to him, will depend on how diligent you are with what's in front of you. Amen. Turn to Malachi. We're going to continue on regarding these priests and regarding the Levites a bit. And we're going to see something here in Malachi. Your brother Michael actually dug up and presented to me. So I'm a a messenger of the word of Malachi and some some food that your brother Michael Spence brought to you this morning. And I'm I'm, I'm always amazed and humbled at how the Lord will align things and align exactly what's on Pastor Jake's heart with a brother and a son of this house's heart. Um, So it's important that we know that and we know that that's the way the Lord would move in all of us. It's connecting us with the words. But this is found in Malachi chapter 2. Malachi is giving warning through the word of the Lord has come to him to speak to Israel, his people. (coughs) Remind them of the prerequisites that are required. It's a hard book, right? It's a heavy book. But may we be encouraged to know that if we hold to these prerequisites and these truths that the Lord is instructing us in, that this won't be said of us. It says, and now this commandment is for you, O priest. If you do not listen, and if you do not take it to heart to give honor to my name, says the Lord of hosts, then I will send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings, and indeed, I have cursed them already, because you are not taking it to heart. Take your blessings away. Behold, I am going to rebuke your offspring. That's terrifying. And I will... Spread refuse on your faces. The refuse of your feast. And you will be taken away with it. Then you will know that I have sent this commandment to you. That my covenant may continue with Levi. Says the Lord of hosts. My covenant with him was one of life and peace. And I gave them to him as an object of reverence. So he revered me and stood in all of my name. True instruction was in his mouth. And unrighteousness was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness. And he turned many back from iniquity. For the lips of a priest should preserve knowledge. How's that for a prerequisite? Priests of this house. Priests of your homes. The lips of a priest should preserve knowledge. And men should seek instruction from (coughs) His mouth, from that priest's mouth. Good word. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. Amen. You see how beautiful and powerful that is as we get it right? Yeah. The prerequisite is you should be upholding righteousness, priest, so that you can obtain the truth of God and so that others may come to you to hear the very words of God. Amen. You're a messenger. But it says, as for you, you have turned aside from the way. And you have caused many to stumble by the instruction you have corrupted. The covenant of Levi, says the Lord of hosts. So I also have made you despised and abased before all people, just as you are not keeping my ways, but are showing partiality in the instruction. Do not compromise from the instruction. Do not deviate from the prerequisites ever. At least our generation's destroyed. At least... At least we break covenant with our God and, and he has to leave us abased before our enemies. That's terrifying speech, right? Yeah, yeah. But we won't do it. We will cling to the words of the Lord and we will arise in confidence 
like a Gideon, like a man of valor, knowing that it is our humility, knowing that it is our spiritual hunger, knowing that it is our, our desire to see these miracles and these things performed again and again and again, yep. that we won't fall to this type of right. discouragement or this type of destruction, rather. Yep. Yep. And we were going to go through the book of Titus, and we were going to talk about Paul being a bondservant, being a man who held tightly to the prerequisites of the King Jesus and held so tightly to him that he reproduced after his kind and set up men like Titus yeah. that would establish other men, other elders of churches and would hold confidently to him, hold faithful to the words and to not let anyone look down upon him for this. We were going to talk about that, but perhaps we'll move forward to Pastor Jake's 2 Timothy 4. So that we can we can close, but we want you to know that you are enlisted. Amen. That the Lord has surely called your name. It's why you're here. It's why you've been here, and it's why you remain here. Yeah. It's because the Lord has great purpose for you, yeah. all of you. Now, how we do with this uh, this weight, this glorious weight of responsibility? How we do now with these prerequisites that have been given to us and. These things that have been shown us, it falls on us. It is your pastor's responsibility to hold you to these things. But it's your responsibility to want to be held to them. Yeah. If you want to further see what lies ahead, then we have to stay in this mode of advancement. Yeah, yeah. Come on. If we want to be realigned and rightly get this right, then we have to stop being foolish. Yeah. We have to stop being lied to by the enemy. We have to stop being reminded of our former selves. We have to stop being reminded that we might not be the ones. We might, I'm telling you, you are. Now, if we believe that and walk in that, then these victories are ours. And they're for us to abound in and to increase in. But if we hold to the foolishness and the lies of the enemy, and we attach ourselves to those, then that's what we'll get. Yeah. We'll get foolishness and we'll get destruction. But may it never be. Yeah. For you and for me, for our yeah. families, will be like Gideon, yep. a valiant warrior. Amen? Amen. Psalm 31, 15, David says, My times are in your hand. Yep. My events are in your hand. The things that you have determined and planned for me are in your hand. The important part of that is that you don't take them into your own hand. Yeah. You don't ever try to act as if your times, as if what happens next in your life, what season you longing for that you want, that it's not in your hand. It's not for you to control. It's not for you to demand it happen now. There is a contentment. There is a diligence. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 says this. I charge you, this is Paul, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and I charge you by his appearing in his kingdom, is what I charge you. Preach the word. Preach it. Be ready. Everyone say, be ready. Be ready. In season and out of season. Yeah. Which means that there's no season. You just be ready. You just be ready. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Now, diligence right now with what's in front of you, this is the prerequisite of enlistment. You're enlisted, and so what does he ask of you? What does he require of you? What is the prerequisite of those that he is going to call up into service, into, ex into an exact commission. We have shown you what it looks like practically in the Levites and Gideon. Yep. Pastor Zach spoke quickly concerning Paul and the men that have been raised up by him. There, are no, there is no waiting for circumstances to change or situations to yeah. shift. Yeah. Lord spoke this to me actually yesterday as I was walking to this tent to get some propane tanks. Um, it was... Don't, there's no waiting. You ever think, I'm ready. I, I, I see some things that need to be done in my home. I see some things that need to happen. So there's some things in life that I'd like to see happen. Perhaps men of your homes, you think this. And you go, but I don't feel like I can do anything until something that's beyond my control changes a bit. So some conditions outside of my control shift, then I, then I know I'll be able to do something about this. Yeah. Until the situation changes, I can't really do anything about it. Yeah. And the truth is, mm -hmm. there is no waiting. Yeah. 
The prerequisite is this, that you don't wait for circumstance or situation Amen. to change. Yeah. But you be diligent. Remain diligent with an upright heart, always consecrating that which is set before you. Always consecrating and, and keeping holy the things that are in your hands and on your shoulders. This diligence is the prerequisite. We have only right now and today to be faithful and diligent and victorious with what has been entrusted to us, whether great or small. That's good. We have only today. This is the prerequisite of the enlisted. When he looks, will he find this in us? Yeah. Scripture says that the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are wholly his. Yeah. That's good. All right. That's good. Luke 17, verses 7 through 10 speak of when the master returns. Do servants of a house say, hey, I did everything I did, now reward me? He says, no. But servants, at the end of the day, they've only done what's required of them. Yeah. He's asking you to only do what's merely required of you. Yeah. Remain diligent yeah. to where he has placed you. Yes. And if you remain diligent, you can be sure that when the need arises, yeah. Yeah. that Julio, your name, could be called. Amen. But if you're not diligent, if you are discontent, the scripture says godliness with contentment is great gain. If you are discontent with where you are, if, you, if your discontentment leads you to, be, to lack diligence, if your heart begins to fail you and you do not remain diligent with what's in front of you, with what's in your hands, then perhaps you might hear that your name would have been called or that you would have been available, but because of this past lack of diligence, you are not available for the commission that he wants to give. You have not remained ready as those yeah. who are Amen. enlisted. Y'all stand to your feet with me. Amen.